Morris. My partner, Liz Perkinswick, is a chiropractor. She's been practicing for 31 years. As she, her, her reach is from Ann Arbor to Rockford down to Maryville, Indiana, for clients. She's been doing it for a long time. And it's amazing how dysfunctional people are who come in to get healed. But it all comes back to the food. And so uh, it's exciting to see that you all have, have fought the bug. And I want to share what I've learned in my, my brief um, time. I've only been doing this for two years. I spent a lot, of, you know, 35 years as a hospital consultant and, and executive. And as Liz likes to tease me, practicing on the dark side. And so I've, I've now seen the light, and I want to share the, the journey with you. Um, it's, a, it's a really cool presentation, but the system forces me to stand over here, because I usually get very excited and animated. But maybe it'll be better, because this way, we're, we're going to put this um, out on YouTube and uh, just let people know what's going on with the, the food. And um, we'll just Your name? <laughs> Do you have a microphone? Um, do I have a microphone? Yes. No, but I will speak loudly. Good. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Like, like Teddy Roosevelt, I walk softly and or talk softly, but I carry a big stick. <laughs> okay. Thomas Jefferson once said, "Enlighten the people generally, and tyranny and oppressions of body and mind will vanish like evil at the dawn of day." And think of me as the town crier. We have a huge problem with our food system. I think many of you know it. I'm going to go into it in a way that maybe you've never heard before about just how bad it is and how important it is that you continue with this commitment in the work that you're doing. Who am I? Recovering Hospital Exec has become a wellness coach. Um, Self-appointed health czar means I just have a really strong opinion about what it takes to get healthy. I'm 58. I'm living a 30, last 35 years and I'm committed to integrity, which is a very serious pledge that I made to myself. Uh, late in life athlete, I run a few marathons, did a uh, Olympic district triathlon, uh, and also have jumped out of a plane at three miles high. If you haven't done that, you've got to do it. It's an incredible rush. Uh, you're dropping at 186 feet <laughs> per second. There's nothing like it in the world. But you become very clear about what's important in life. When you're dropping. <laughs> and when, when you see the, the postage stamp get really big, it's like it's, it's very powerful. I sleep well, I have a very clear conscience, and I delight in separating fact from fiction. And that's what lead, leads me to this presentation about you have been misled and you have been misfed. And I'm going to prove it during the course of my presentation. And I, I delight in questions. I've never met a question I didn't love. So feel free, raise your hand if you don't understand something, and make sure that the entire group isn't stuck on that one idea. OK, I have seven messages. Um, why don't we let's see, can pass this out? Why don't you each take one? And you can check off and make sure that I cover all seven messages uh, during the course of the presentation. My goal is to get you to never buy conventional food again. Ever again. Okay. Is this true? Is the earth flat? No. 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 Right? We know that it's actually a blue marble. Right? Now, how long did it take people to accept that fact? It took 2,000 years. Pythagoras discovered it in 522 BC. In 1522, a year after Magellan died, his crew got back from circumnavigating the globe. But it took 2,000 years for the average person to truly accept that the earth was round. The intelligentsia knew it, the learned knew it, but the common person wouldn't accept it. We don't have 2,000 years. Our food system is in a state of crisis. We, we can't, 
We can't afford to let it get any worse. And what I'm telling you is that the universe is flat. And, and what, what you're going to hear is going to be like, wait a minute, that's not possible. But here's the poster that's, I've had this poster for 40 years, and I've never understood why it was important until I prepared for this presentation. The universe, what's circled in red, the known universe is flat. It's like, it just boggles your mind to even think about it. But that's, that's the truth. It's all a matter of perspective. Okay, my operating premise, the food you're eating, regardless of its source, even if it's organic, is contaminated. And you don't even know that. With what? It's genetically modified particles that are in the air, that are increasingly in our environment, increasingly in our soils. Just hear me out. This is the milk truck that used to bring my milk when I was a little boy in Baltimore, Maryland. I lived there until I was through college. And I'm a horrible singer. I won't take the time. I actually downloaded the jingle. But the last part of it is really important. And don't, don't vote me off the island for being a lousy singer. Milk and butter and eggs and cheese, fresh from the farm to you. If you don't own a cow, call Cloverland now. Northfield 92222. Two, two, two. Can you believe 50 years after I heard that, that jingle is still playing in my head? <laughs> milk and butter and eggs and cheese. So let's look at milk and butter, eggs and cheese. This is our image of where milk comes from. Bucolic, beautiful golden currency cows. Actually, Liz grew up on a dairy farm, so she understands this in a very intimate way. Um, she challenged me about a year ago to drink unprocessed milk for the first time in my life. And my hand was shaking like that as I put the glass off because I, I was sure I was going to die right off the spot. <laughs> but this is, in fact, what actually happens. Cows are chained to their stalls. They're fed GMO corn and soybean, soon to be GMO alfalfa, which you probably have heard about in the last 10 days. Milk is pasteurized. You know how they know when milk is pasteurized? Because all the enzymes are gone. 100%. That's when they know it's pasteurized. Then it's homogenized, which means they shake the fat up so it gets real small. Then it's easier to get the fat into your body that way. And then it's bottled for two and, and skim milk. Um, butter, right out of a churner. Has anyone ever had butter right out of a churner? It's great, isn't it? It's awesome. Well, this is what most people eat. Can't believe it's butter. It's like, oh my gosh. <clears throat> Again, from cows that are fed GMO feed. In Europe, butter has 85% butter fat. In America, it's 65%. Why the difference? Because of our obsession with fat, saturated fat. And they actually pour water into that and then into the butter. And that's why none of the European recipes work in America, because there's too much, too much water. Two of Liz's sons are chefs, and they just discovered that fact. Um, these are the ingredients for, I can't believe it's butter, I can't believe it's not butter, whatever it's called. Water, liquid soybean oil, salt, sweet cream buttermilk. It's the fourth ingredient that begins to hint at butter. Soybean oil? Soybean is 92% GMO worldwide. And my favorite part is there's zero calories from fat. Why do we eat butter? Essential fatty acids. They're called essential for a reason. Because your body can't make them. And you need omega-3 and omega-6 in your diet, right? The problem is, our, the standard American diet is so out of proportion, some, some uh, researchers say it's as much as 165 to 1, omega-6 to omega-3. Butter is 2 to 1. Two parts omega-6 to one part omega-3. It's been around for a thousand years. Eggs. Does anyone eat their eggs from the girls in the garden? Girls, they're called girls. The chickens, they're called <laughs> girls. 
we, we get eggs from a farmer up in Rockford, and invariably, I mean, these, are, these, are, these are huge eggs. And it's like you need a hammer to break them. <laughs> They're incredible. But that's not the conditions where ch chickens, this is a typical area. Um, caged full time, typically never see the light of day, and again, the GMO soy. So the, the thing is, you're thinking about the fact, well, I don't eat any GMO. It's, it's in the food that's being fed to the products that you're eating, and you're not even aware of it. And this is my favorite part. That's the sunlight that they see. And finally, cheese. This is from a European cheese mart. Um, this is from, from Denmark. <clears throat> but this is what we think is cheese, easy <laughs> cheese. Again, same old, same old for the milk. It's more of a compound, and it's a, you know just a typically industrialized low fat. All right, well, this is stuff that you all already know. But you don't always think about it. We, what happens is we have this bucolic image in our mind, but this is the reality of the average person. And you're asking, well, is it safe? Is it the same? And the important thing is if they can get you asking the wrong questions, it doesn't matter what the answer is. And trust me, there is a they out there, and they do want you asking those two questions. Is it safe? And is it the same? That's all they want you asking. That's the question they want you to ask. We'll get to another question later in the presentation. Okay. So what does the American food system, how does it relate to the HMS Titanic? What's the difference? Yeah. Um, there's like so much variety, like on the Titanic, like it was like high and mighty, but it's about to like get an iceberg, like people, the iceberg being like people's health. Well, the good answer, but the difference is they both hit an iceberg, but in the American food system, we won't admit it. The three drugs of choice in America, sugar, caffeine, and denial. Does anybody know what actually happened on the Titanic? They were cruising at 32 knots per hour. It was full tilt and going as fast as they possibly could. The, the ship owner, Ismay, wanted to prove how powerful the ship was. And he wanted to get to New York a half a day early. So they're going 32 knots in 32 degree water. And right up here is the crow's nest. And they had two guys up in the crow's nest looking for icebergs because they had been getting these radio signals all day long about icebergs. Okay? So they spotted one. But what happened was by the time the guys saw it up in the crow's nest, got word to the bridge, and then bridge got down to the, <coughs> to the steam room. It was too late. They only had one minute from the time they saw it to the time they were going to hit it. 60 seconds. 60 seconds, and it happens like that. They didn't have binoculars. If they had binoculars, how much time would they have had on that ship to make a change? Ten minutes. Ten minutes is an entirely different time frame. And this is where it gets fascinating. This is a guy, Charles Lightoller, who was the second officer of the HMS Titanic. Here he is. Here's the first officer, and here's the captain of the ship. At the last minute before that ship went out to sea, the second officer was put on another ship. Lightoller, who was the third officer, was made the second officer. Guess whose job it is to carry the binoculars on the ship? Second officer. And the guy took him with him. And the, and the crew was a little upset. They said, but, but Mr. Lightoller, aren't we going to need binoculars? And he said, don't worry. We'll pick him up in New York when we get there. That's a quote from his granddaughter, because that's the story that he told her when she was a little girl. They didn't have binoculars. All that tragedy because they didn't have the foresight to see what was going to happen. 
So the captain of our Titanic, George Herbert Walker Bush, in 1992, signed an executive order that year called the Doctrine of Substantial Equivalence. Have you all ever heard of it? Substantial equivalence. It rules the genetically modified world. And what that doctrine says is all food developed through biotechnology was from this point forward considered the same as conventional food. And the second point, which is very not really talked a lot about, it barred government agencies from doing any kind of safety testing before the food was introduced into the market. Wow. That's pretty cool. In effect, what he said was, we want no binoculars. He was even more bold than Lightoller. He said, we don't want binoculars. We don't want the public to know what's going on. That takes a lot of courage. So how do I know that we're a Titanic and we're going down? I spent 35 years in the hospital industry. The first week I was on the job, my first job was a planner for a hospital out in Washington, D.C. 85% of the reason why people were in the hospital is because they didn't eat right, they smoked, they drank, they didn't deal with stress. And so what's happened is from 1985 to 2008, obesity is off the chart. It's now 35% of Americans are morbidly obese. That's not a good thing. Uh, and another 35%, actually another 37% are overweight. In this audience, that's not, that's not even an issue. Diabetes, off the chart. It's going to double in the next 20 years. So however bad you think it is now, it's going to double in the next 20 years. Despite what you may hear about deaths from heart attacks going down, yes, in fact, they have, but heart disease continues to grow at an un unprecedented rate. 85% growth in the last 23 years, and hospitalizations are up fourfold. It's out of control. So I did a study about two years ago before I saw the light for a couple of clients in, in the North Carolina area. And between 1910 and 1925, the growth of chronic disease is going to accelerate like a rocket taking off. And it's all because we don't eat right. 1910 or 2010? 2010. Thank you. Thank you. So if it's so dire, why hasn't fill in the blank told me about this problem? Why haven't my friends and family? We're clueless. Why hasn't my trainer too focused on fat? My grocer. Food industry is controlled by five firms. If you've seen Food Inc., and I'm sure many of you have. Um, my physician. If they're lucky, they get one hour of nutrition, and they're too busy writing scripts. They don't have time to worry about what are you eating. If you want to have, if you really want to have fun with your family <coughs> physician, ask them what you should be eating just to see the look of anguish on their face because they don't have a clue. My public health department, they're stuck in the germ theory that was developed in 1865 by Pasteur. When they worry about contamination in the health department, they want people to wash their hands. They're not thinking about the fact how pervasive genetically modified food is in our food system. 80% of the food we eat has GMO in it. My news station, they're not going to bite the hand that feeds them. Think about who are the advertisers on TV besides pharmaceutical firms, and cars, and cell phones, the fourth group is food. My government, sorry, they got barred in 92. Yeah? Um, when you said that physicians get one hour of nutrition, I don't know what that means. An hour, like, doing what? In, okay, in four years of education, of, of medical school education, they might get one hour. Like a class? A class. It's, it's talked about in a class. Probably the most progressive uh, school, at least historically, I don't know whether it's still true, but Northwestern's medical school was ahead of the curve. Uh, and they had a lot of, of professors down there who did focus on nutrition. But it's more the exception than the rule. It's very rare that a physician would even know that there's a link between food and health. It's like there's no connection. Um, when I went to the doctor, like, a year ago, it's like, you know, like you need to lose weight or you're a little bit heavier than you should be. I'm like, well, how should I do it? And he, he laughed and he told me, like, when I figure it out to tell him because he's having the same problem. Because he's like, he's heavier, like, a lot heavier than me. So they don't really know. The, 
real quick, the, the, the medical nutrition and weight loss communities are stuck in the first law of thermodynamics. You are overweight because you eat too much and you don't exercise enough. And you say, of course, that makes perfect sense. Again, that's that the earth is round. Earth is flat. Do you chide someone who's growing because they eat more food? But every one of you went through it when you were in your early teens, right? You were hungry all the time. And you were eating. It's because your hormones were changing that you ate more. You eat more because of hormonal activity. And it's the same thing whether you're going this way or going this way. Hormones are totally out of balance in America. And it's because of the food we eat. Okay. People would rather believe a simple lie than the complex truth. That was a saying that's been around for a few thousand years. Uh, every, everything that deceives may be said to enchant. And we are never deceived, we deceive ourselves. Again, back to the three drugs of choice. The fact that you all are here means that you want to learn. There, there are probably, you each have 10 friends that wondered, why in the world are you going to Evanston, Illinois to hear about food? It's okay, isn't it? Well, people fall into three camps. They don't know that it's bad. They don't care that it's bad. They don't want to know. And most people don't want to know. About 80% of the people don't want to know. And what, what I've learned in my short tenure as a wellness coach, it's actually easier, it would be easier for me to get you to change your religion than to get you to change your diet. It's that personal, it's that private, it's that intimate. And you're convinced whatever you're eating, it's right for you. It's a huge challenge. Mark Anderson, if you all, let me, back up, let me just make an observation. Legally, in the state of Illinois, what I'm allowed to tell you is the books that I read. That's what I'm legally allowed to tell you, and what's inside those books. So, lies my teacher told me, deep nutrition. Anybody heard of deep nutrition? Get that book. You need to read that book. It'll blow your Who's mind. It by? by Kate, C-A-T-E, Shanahan. She is a physician, but she gets it. She's, she's brilliant. Um, Seeds of Deception, Empty Harvest, amazing book. If you haven't read it, by Mark Anderson. Amazing book about what's happened to the soil. Seeds of Destruction, and this is the one that I, I couldn't read this book. It was so depressing. This is about the FDA. It's the 100 year <coughs> expose of the FDA and how they misled us and misfed us. I read the first couple chapters and I got so depressed I had to stop reading it. What's the name of it? The Hundred Year Lie. Hundred Year Lie. By whom? His name is um, Randall Fitzgerald. If anyone reads it, please let me know what it says. It's like I, I got to a point where I just I couldn't I couldn't keep going. Mark Anderson makes the observation: No civilization has lived beyond the health of its soil. Has anyone ever? I'm sure you all are from across the Midwest. But has anyone spent any time on a, a field in Iowa? Okay. This is a picture from Iowa. That's, that's how black it is. It's incredible. I drove around the state uh, about five years ago. I couldn't believe how rich the soil was. So, fascinating. Farming actually has been influenced by our belief system. In the two major schools of thought. You have Cartesian and quantum thinking. Cartesian is all about the object. It's all about, I can conquer this object. Quantum thought is all about the field. Pardon the pun. I'm not talking about farming fields, but the field as we know it. And it's all about coexistence. And we've gotten caught up in that. And there's a whole history of enlightened minds that have shaped the thinking on both sides. What you probably didn't know is that for each individual on this side of the camp, there's someone just as powerful, but they're called the anti-hero. Louis Pasteur's competitor was Antoine Béchamp. Antoine Béchamp said, actually, no. It's the, it's the environment that we're in 
that changes our ability to respond to disease. And what's fascinating is that Pasteur on his deathbed said Bechamp was right. Justice von Liebig, does anybody know who that is? He's the German in 1840 who discovered that plants need nitrogen. And he came up with NPK. Brilliant idea. Again, on his deathbed, he recanted. He said, I wish I'd never done this. Because he knew how it had destroyed farming. But again, Julius Hensel was his competitor. But no one would listen to Julius because there was more money to be made by what Leibniz was all about. And now we've got Watson and Crick and then Monsanto and company telling us that genetics is the future. You, you can't live without it. And of course, there's all sorts of thinkers. Probably the most enlightening, Bruce Lipton. Anyone know Bruce Lipton? Amazing guy. Uh, the Biology of Belief by Bruce Lipton. It's an amazing book about just how dynamic our bodies are and how important um, the field is. And the brain of your cell is not the nucleus that has the DNA. That's just a Xerox machine. The brain of your cell is your membrane where the environment touches the membrane. That's the true brain. And that was what Bruce Lipton's doctoral thesis was done. He's a, he teaches up at UW-Madison in the medical school. The guy is brilliant. And there's a growing body of independent scientists who are saying, no, it's the field that's important, not the plant. And what happened was the American farmer began to lose their land when they focused on the plant. And that's what farming is all about now. It's all about the plant. Pesticides, insecticides, and herbicides, and fertilizer. It's all about the plant. Let's forget the field. When the settlers first came to America, how, much, how many inches of topsoil was there? Over 25 inches. How much of it is left now? Less than six. In some areas, it's down to two inches. It's not a good thing. No civilization has outlived the health of its soil. None. Despite what Monsanto and company would have you believe. Okay, so how have we been misled and misfed? Does anybody know this nursery rhyme? It's true, right? If you eat fat, you're going to get fat, right? It's not, it's not, when I'm talking to clients and I tell them to eat more butter, they say, well, you might as well just slather it on my thighs. Like, no, it doesn't work. How do, you, how do people get extra weight? How does, the, how does the body work? Does anyone know the, how the body works? You have 100 trillion cells in your body. Did you know that? 100 trillion. How many of them are turning over every hour? A billion cells. That's a lot of cells. So why do we eat? Why do we eat? So what do you mean by turning over? They die. Oh. They die. So you, and your body needs to replace them. OK? So why do we eat? There are three reasons why we eat. Get nutrients, okay. Energy. Energy. Enjoyment. That, in America, yes. <laughs> no, that's really, that's... If, well, not just know, in America, America, everywhere. I know. There's a lot of customs <laughs> and a lot of, a lot of social um, structure around food. But the third reason, biologically, why we eat is to communicate with your genes. <clears throat> food sends signals to your genes. It's very, very important. This is the third pyramid, and the Americans did exactly what they were told to do. And that's what's happened. We did exactly what they asked us to do. And now we've, we've got this nation of people who are struggling with weight, diabetes, heart disease. Yeah. I think to differ. I don't think we did that at all. I think meat was much closer to the bottom of the pyramid, and fruits and vegetables were much closer to the top in reality what we were doing. The New York Times did an article back in 2008, and they compared food as it was eaten in 1970 and food as it was eaten in 2006. And there was a dramatic shift. And there was a shift away from, we, we do eat meat, yes, absolutely. But there was a tremendous increase in the amount of grains and carbohydrates in the country. Because people were told, you must stop eating saturated fat. It's going to give you a heart attack. 
and we believed it. We were convinced of it. So what happened? They came up with a new pyramid, and now it's even more carbohydrates in the, in the uh, diet. Again, this is premised on we need to exercise more. I mean, this is, it's like, what were, I'm, I'm like, what are you thinking about? This, this pyramid is the biggest joke in the nutrition community. <laughs> but let's just look at one food substance, sugar. Look at 1910 to 2010. In 100 years, what's happened? When, in George Washington's time, the average colonial ate three pounds of sugar per year. Now it's over 200 pounds per person per year. That's 160 pounds of the granulated stuff, 150 pounds of that. It's 50 pounds of high fructose corn syrup and about 10 pounds of artificial chemical sweeteners. And most of it is used, and you don't even know it. It's in the food system, and now what's happened is sugar We'll see in a little bit. The sugar is now mostly genetically modified, which with beet sugar. But if you, this is just based on actual consumption. In 2010, the average American ate 65 teaspoons of sugar per day. Your body is designed for one. You you have the metabolic ability to comfortably digest one teaspoon of sugar and yet we're eating 65, and if you follow the food pyramid that they want us to follow, you would be eating over 100 teaspoons of sugar a day. You are being misled, you are being misfed, and you don't even know it. The best thing you can do, just ease off the sugar. The woman that was, I'm not sure you all met her, she was another one of the speakers this morning, I was talking with her downstairs before the, the program started, she used to weigh twice as much as she weighs now. She lost 123 pounds, which is, that's pretty impressive. And I asked her, what did you do? What did you do to lose all that weight? It took her two and a half years. What was her sole strategy? Stop sugar. Anything white, she eliminated in her diet. Flour, sugar, pasta, anything that had white in it. And she lost 123 pounds. But she also changed her thinking, she changed her exercise program, but she said the biggest impact was the diet, and it was getting the sugar out of her, out of her body. Because what happens in your body, when you have excess sugar, you have excess insulin. Insulin has one job, must store this glucose. Must store this, it's, that's what it's programmed to do. And it will do it two ways. It'll put it in muscle cells, and if you don't have enough muscle cells, it'll put it in fat cells. And the amazing thing is, and this is like no one in America talks about this, your liver produces cholesterol. Well, you produce more, 10 times more cholesterol in a day than you could possibly eat. Guess what supercharges the coenzyme A reductase factory that makes cholesterol? Insulin. So if you want to, if you want to, if you're worried about cholesterol, Stop eating sugar. But this was the amazing thing. You can't make a profit in America telling people, stop eating sugar. You can make a profit by selling people statin drugs. Now, if insulin has a sister hormone. It's called glucagon. Guess what glucagon's job? Anyone here, a lot of born, does anyone have an older brother or sister? Anybody? Okay. So when you're around your older brother and sister, you, you kind of often you defer to them, right? Well, glucagon does the same thing. When insulin's around, glucagon just kind of waits for it to leave. And when, in, when insulin is not there, glucagon takes over. Guess what glucagon's job is? Shut down the cholesterol-making factory. But if you're eating 65 teaspoons of sugar a day, glucagon never gets to do its job. Sugar. It's the number one drug of choice in America. <coughs> Anybody know who this is? Ansel Keys? You ever heard of him? He's the guy that invented K-rations during the Second World War. They're called K-rations because his last name is Keys. He fed the troops. He was a big deal. University of Minnesota, nutrition, 
He actually has a, a PhD in oceanography and physiology. He's not a doctor. But this guy single-handedly browbeat the medical, nutrition, and research community into believing that cholesterol was the bad guy. He was born in 1900. He was a smart guy. But he realized later in life that he had created a disaster. So these are two quotations from articles he wrote towards the end of his life. He died when he was 98 years old. In 1987, he, wrote, he was interviewed by the New York Times. That's a fairly respected publication. I've come to think that cholesterol is not as important as we used to think it was. Let's reduce cholesterol by reasonable means. He wrote that article in response to the fact that statins were taking off. He's like, wait a minute, this is, this is not right. Four years later, he wrote an article in the New England Journal of Medicine. That's the Bible of medical research. It is, compared to The Lancet, it's probably the most influential publication in modern medical circles. There's no connection whatsoever between cholesterol and food and cholesterol and blood, and we've known that all along. We've known that all along. I didn't know that. Did you know that? Is that what you were told? Is that what you've heard? No. Cholesterol, if you even look at butter, you're going to get a heart attack. That's what we've been taught. It's unbelievable. Cholesterol doesn't matter unless you happen to be a chicken or a rabbit. And that's because the feeding studies that they did, chickens and rabbits are herbivores. Rabbits for sure. And that was a, it was a Russian study back in the 50s where they fed it rat, rabbit chow covered with meat. Meat with um, um, fat. And guess what happened? The rabbits, the bodies were storing cholesterol wherever they could because they couldn't process it. They're not set up to process it. And that was the study that formed the basis of cholesterol is bad for Americans. 1950s, thanks to Russia. Okay. You are what you eat. Do you really believe it? Because if you really believed it, you would never eat the food that you eat on a daily basis. We eat faxed food in a faxed world. My, my son, um, oldest son, is an investment banker downtown, and he thought I needed a little educating, so he's enrolled me in The Economist. It's a great publication, it's like, it's really intense. But this, this one caught my eye a couple weeks ago. It's, it's actually a violin that was made by this machine, the EOS laser centering 3D printer. I have no idea what that is. But it actually, you can play it, which is kind of mind-boggling. And that's what we've grown up to, is we, th we see this and we say, isn't that cool? It's a facsimile, it's not real. And that's what's happened to our diet. We're eating facts food. It's not real food. The soil doesn't have any nutrients in it anymore. They knew that back in the 30s. And so they needed NPK and all these other chemicals to put this artificial soup into the, into the plants we're eating fast food. Yeah. So do you think organic food has more nutrients than conventional? Hands down, absolutely yes. And I, I, I don't know if I have it in, but Rutgers did a study a couple of years ago and compared organic food to conventional food. And on every nutrient that they studied, it was almost a factor of 10 to 1, greater nutrients. Again, back to our um, paradigm shift of, of thinking. Genetics versus epigenetics. The word, the phrase epi means higher than genetics. Long story short, you are what you eat. The food that you eat, in fact, creates a different environment for your body and creates different signaling for your genes. And what, what Kate Shanahan does a beautiful job of doing is explaining why it's so important to eat the right food because you express your genes differently. You're, you think differently. You process food differently. You're able to function differently. It's as simple as eating the right food. The whole idea, you know, when my dad had a heart attack and my mom had cancer, and it's genetic, and I'm just like, no. It's, they've now discovered 500 genes that respond to the food. It's our lifestyle that 
causes gene expression. Gene expression is the, is the key. Randy Jurl is a very noted geneticist at, at Duke University. Each nutrient, each interaction, each experience can manifest itself through biochemical changes that dictate gene expression. You are what you eat. Okay, does anybody know what this is? Canola. Canola, very good. Ding, ding, ding. Most people are like, I have no idea. Uh, canola uh, is, is probably closer to 90% GMO now, but this is a, a beautiful field of genetically modified canola up in Canada. And you can see the general progression of genetically modified food in our food system. What's fascinating to me is that in 2008, there was no genetically modified sugar beet. And in less than two years, it's now 98% GMO. That, that's not a good trend. And alfalfa just got approved uh, two weeks ago. You said, why does that matter? Because this is the stuff that's fed to the animals, for those of us who are meatitarians, that we eat. Yes? Where are these statistics coming from? This is from the Institute for Responsible Technology. And Jeffrey Smith, um, if, you, if you haven't read this book, amazing book. This guy is a one-man band trying to beat back Monsanto. Seeds of deception. And you're going to learn things in here you're like, what I'm doing is I'm giving you the headlines from what all these other workers have done. But Jeffrey Smith is probably the most informed influential and tenacious person about trying to push back this movement of, of genetically modified food. Does he have videos online? He has, he, he has uh, PowerPoint presentations, <coughs> and I think he does have three or four videos. Thank you for putting that up. Have you all ever heard the expression caveat emptor, E-M-P-T-O-R? It's a Latin phrase. It means let the buyer beware. So I've coined my own phrase. Caveat eator, let the eater be there. About 80% of what's called conventional, I love that term, conventional. It just sounds so nice. It sounds so comforting. It's conventional. No, it's not. It's, con it's contaminated. 80% of the food we eat is contaminated. Again, this is the best estimate that people have. Trust me. The food industry keeps things pretty well guarded. Pretty well guarded. These are, the, these are the qualities that are sought in America. Better, faster, and cheaper. And what, whoops, hold on. And what we've elected to focus on in America is faster and cheaper. We gave up better. There is no better in America. Everything was about speed and cost. People are obsessed with, with cost. The food's got to be cheap. You get what you pay for. It's that simple. So this is we got what we asked for, right? In 1910 was when food first became refined. They took out 100 nutrients, and they refined wheat. 100 nutrients were taken out of, it, out of the food. Well, then we entered the era of enriched, so they put back 12. Do you feel enriched? They took out 100, they gave you back 12. Wow, you should feel pretty good about that. Then we went into the era of processed food. Russell Blaylock is a neurosurgeon down in um, Mississippi quite active in, in food safety. And what he's just determined is that starting in 1948, the amount of food additives doubled every decade since 1948. We'll do the math. And you go from 1 to 2 to 4 to 8 to 60. 64 times more food additives today than we had back when your parents were young. And what this book profiles are the 10,000 chemicals that are used in our food that the FDA says, it's okay. 
10,000 food, 10,000 chemicals in the food system. Then we have the era of hydrogenated. Oops, we didn't know that that created trans fats, and that's really what the cause of, of heart disease is. It's kind of a little mistake there. Um, and now we're in the, in the era of engineered food, and you're led to believe that there's rigor and precision. And we don't have a clue what they've done. We are absolutely clueless about it. Are you feeling a little uneasy right now? So let's just take a quick peek at the uh, one part of the American food system. Thanks to Toto, we're going to take a look at it. <laughs> Who is that? Mark McGuire. Mark McGuire. He was, he was a big deal. Mm -hmm. he, got, he got people on base, right? Well, it turns out that milk was the lead-off batter in the whole movement of genetically modified food. This had to work. This batter had to get on base, according to Peter Harden, who's the editor of Milk Group. So milk is a, about a $29 billion a year industry. That's pretty big. It's a lot of money. Over 9 million cows produce $29 billion worth of revenue for the farmers. Put it in perspective, Coca-Cola, this, this is in 2009, Coca-Cola's revenue in 2009, $31 billion. And they own 50% of the market. So that gives you a sense of how carbonated beverage relates to milk. But milk is still very important to us. You got 9 million cows, you're going to do some research, right? You're going, to just, you're going to really study this carefully because if, when you start putting recombinant bovine growth hormone in these animals, which is designed to increase milk production by 15 to 20 percent, you want to know what's going to happen, right? You want to, you want to know what, what kind of second and third order effects are going to happen, right? So when they do a study, a, a political study of 300, Americans, 300 million Americans, they talked about 2,000 people. So we got 9 million cows. How many people are we going to, how many cows are we going to study? Just a number, what would you guess? Well, I hope more than one. A hundred, okay, anybody? 300,000. 300, 300, right. A large number, right? This is the truth. This is, this is actually picture of a uh, milk carton down the street of, at Pete's coffee shop. And it says, milk from farmers who pledge not to use RBST, no significant difference has been shown between milk derived from RBST, treated and non-treated cows. And this was, the wording of this label is a requirement of a lawsuit that Monsanto took against this dairy in Maine back in 2003. And the study, the statistical significance, the no significant difference, was not based on 100 cows or 300 cows. It was based on three cows. And to get statistical significance in that particular case, you have to have at least 49 in the, in the experimental group and 49 in the control group. And they used three and three. Yeah. Do you know? how much it shortens the lives of these cows? Almost by half. I mean, the, the, the cost to the dairy industry for RBST is amazing. The mastitis, which is when the, when the tits get inflamed and infected, and then pus gets into your milk, and you don't even know that. They don't, they don't, let's not talk about that. And the, the fact that there was a sterility problem with the cows, and then the, the, the cows were dying at a younger age. The, the, the cost has been tremendous. Yeah. Um, how is this like a valid experiment? Because um, wouldn't, that, that, wouldn't it be considered like a falsification of data? But that's, that would be a reasonable conclusion to draw. I mean, like you, you couldn't even get away with this in high school. Yeah. <laughs> this, this, this was a study done by an undergraduate student at the University of Gulf in Canada. Seriously. Seriously. And the FDA drew their decision about this by this guy's study. You have been misled. 
you are being misfed. The deception in the food industry is staggering. And that's why it's so important for you to do what you're doing, to get informed and to take an aggressive action against it. If you want to read more about this, where do you read it? Um, well, Jeffrey Smith talks about it in his book. Go to instituteforresponsibletechnology.com. Instituteforresponsibletechnology.com. Uh, the actual citation, um, the, the student's name is Groenwald, G-R-O-E-N-W-A-L-D. And it, the article appears in Science <coughs> Magazine. It'll cost you $30 to get it. And you will read it, and you will be, you will just say, this is not possible. They did, and, and also in the study, it was uh, two rat studies. One was 28 days, another was 90 days. And the outcome was, devastating to the rats. Well, that's the equivalent of doing a about a two-year study of humans. To get a true study of, of multi-generational impact of this speed, you'd have to do, study rats for at least two years to get three generations. They did it for 28 days. Um, if the articles in science, almost every university has print copies of that journal going back 10 years, if okay. not online copies. This was, this was from I believe it's from 1994 or 95. But Groenwald, and just just Google, um, you can't Google three cows. I wish you could, but it's, uh, but go to go to uh, Jeffrey Smith's center. So this is this is the organization that brought us to common bovine growth hormone, Monsanto. Anybody heard of Monsanto? Uh, Ooh, yeah. <laughs> down at the, down in, in uh, St. Louis, the, it's called the Bully of St. Louis. Um, what was their first product? They were founded in 1901. What was the first product that Monsanto produced? Mind you, Monsanto means what in Italian? Pardon? <laughs> Evil, yeah. My saint. My saint. My savior. I mean, you got to laugh about that. This is, is that incredible or what? This evil empire means my savior. Their first product was saccharin, which has been proven to cause cancer. Now, just to put it in perspective, they also produce what are called PCBs. It's a, it's a horrific chemical. And in Anniston, Alabama, they were pumping PCB residue into the water system with untold impact. This is the court order where they were brought to justice. On February 22, 2002, Monsanto was found guilty of negligence, wantonness, suppression of truth, nuisance, trespass, and outrage. Under Alabama, under Alabama law, the rare claim of outrage typically requires conduct so outrageous in character and extreme in degree as to go beyond all possible bounds of decency so as to be regarded as atrocious and utterly intolerable in civilized society. <laughs> that was from the judge's ruling against Monsanto. And guess what? Our friends in Washington just sided up with Monsanto to allow GMO alfalfa. There's no end to this. This, this is evil incarnate. You have to understand that. That's right? Um. Yeah, is this the same Michael Benwell that did the cow experiment, or is that different? Because it, it completely says, different. Like, okay. Completely different, yeah. Um, is there any, <coughs> like, cost to Monsanto because of this ruling? What's that? Like, you know, you said this was a court case. Did they actually, like, get fined or anything like that? Sure, so they, so they paid a couple hundred million dollars. Yeah. That's a rounding error for a company that sells. It's a rounding. We haven't even talked about Agent Orange or DDT. These are the other chemicals that they brought into the environment. And, and the one that, that most people don't know about is, you've heard, you've heard of Roundup Ready? Roundup? Glysophate? Glysophate, however you pronounce it? Google it. Look at what it does. I, had, I was just in a presentation where this, this uh, woman and her husband moved out of the city into the country so they could have a bucolic life and raise their children in safety. Only to find out that for 20 years they were the, the pesticide runoff because their ponds were where the water went 
and all of their children now have endocrine issues that are, are not treatable. They, they're sterile, basically. And they're like, wow, didn't see that one coming. That's, that's brought to you by Monsanto. So, everybody's heard of GMO, right? Genetically Modified Organism. Okay? What I want you to do is from henceforth, from now, from now going forward, I want you to see the initials GTO. And I'll give you a little visual to go with it. You guys are probably too young to know what, <coughs> they don't know what this is. My roommate in college had a GTO. It is a really cool car. GTO, genetically toxic organisms. That's the most important thing for you to learn. Genetically toxic organisms. When you see GMO, think GTO. So it's safe, right? Well, here are some of the findings. We're not going to go into all this. But up in the corner, this is one of the pictures that you can pull off of Institute for Responsible Technology. And this is from a, a rat study using clean rat chow and GMO soy rat chow, which is the GMO fed rat in that picture? The scrum. The, the, the studies are beginning to come out now. Uh, there's this uh, Alexei Surov, S U R O V, just finished a study back in May of 2010. It was a two-year study of Campbell miniature hamsters. Most people study rats. He said, no, I'm going to just study hamsters. Why would you study hamsters? Because hamsters and humans are identical in our biochemistry. We can't, yeah. We can't produce vitamin C, and neither can they. Rats and mice can produce vitamin C. Every study that's ever been done from a physiological standpoint is invalid because of that. But hamsters, you get a clean view. Two-year study, three generations of, of um, critters, and by the third generation, most of them were sterile. Alexei Surov, S-U-R-O-V. These are the studies. I mean, I, I've got, a, I've got a, a document that has 72 different studies that have been done now showing how um, dangerous and toxic GMO is, particularly as it's introduced into the feed that then goes into the products that we eat. Has anyone ever heard of Pottinger, Francis Pottinger? He was an internist back in California, and in the 30s, from 1932 to 1942, he studied 900 cats and how they ate. And he put them into two camps. 400, cat, 400 cats were fed pasteurized milk and cooked meat. And the other cats were fed, they were let out tonight. You go fend for yourself, figure it out. So at the end of 10 years, what happened? The cats that fed, had to fend for themselves were robust, shiny coats, very happy, played with each other. The other cats that have been fed processed food, cooked meat, cooked milk, became psychotic, and they fought, and most of them became sterile. Do you get the consistency here? Again, you can study it. Francis Pottinger, a famous study that's, that people don't want to talk about. You know, and there he is. Actually, by the fourth generation, they, they died out. And again, there's Searle's hamsters. There are two organizations, the Academy of Environmental Medicine um, has been focusing on this. FDA scientists are urging long-term safety studies, and they were ignored repeatedly. Um, and then what they found is just study after study after study around the world. Um, American Academy of Environmental Sciences, again, the, the basic conclusion here is you can no longer ignore that humans are affected by these products. 
And what's happening is, despite what you would hear from the companies producing it, um, the, the plants require 15 times more glyphosate in order to thrive, in order to do their job. 15 times more. What you're led to believe is that they're going to be more robust and they're going to be better for, for the planet and people are, are going to solve starvation. Well, there's diminished fruit <coughs> uptake when you compare solid, which is no glyphosate, to glyphosate, but then transport it in the plant. That's when it becomes important because that's what we eat. The, the plants that are being bombarded with this herbicide do not have the minerals. And if you don't have the minerals, you don't have endocrine function. And if you don't have endocrine function, it's the end game. It doesn't work, despite the, the minerals and supplements you take. Okay. So there, there are two types of, of GMOs. There's BT and HT. What I want you to just walk away with is BT means built-in toxic, and HT means highly toxic. That's not what it really means, but that's what I want you to See, it's, this is bacillus stereogenesis, and this is herbicide tolerant. They're both toxic. <laughs> so I think you all deserve more better in your life. You deserve better facts. It's time you get some labeling on food and find out what are you eating. You deserve better fields. The soils need to be replenished. Colleen her plan of business is Irene. She's, as I said, she's been organic farming for what, 40 years? And you can recover soil. It's called biodynamic gardening. Sir Albert Howard, the founder of organic farming, figured it out back in the 40s. It can be done. And I think a lot of the programs probably that you're attending are talking about it. But you also Demand, you need to demand better food, and it's got to be organic. Oops. When you go shopping, make sure you're dining with nine all the time. Produce labels, every, pro, every bit of produce that you buy in the supermarket has a little label It's about that big. And it has either four numbers or five numbers on it. Have you ever noticed it? Okay, look for the numbers. And it starts with a nine followed by four digits. It's organic. It's certified organic. If it starts with an eight, it's GMO. And if it starts with a three or a four followed by three numbers, it's conventional, which means it's been bombarded with herbicide, insecticide, and every other conceivable chemical. Nine is your friend. And then you're going to say, Wait, wait a minute, oh my God, I, it's going to cost so much. I can't afford organic. Whoops, I'm going the wrong way here. Okay. It's too expensive, I can't afford this. Right, let, me, let me talk about the hidden costs of the food system. There's a farm subsidy that you probably have heard of, but it costs each American $600 a year to support that. That's so that they could grow lousy food, lousy corn, lousy soybean, lousy wheat. <clears throat> and then most people have health insurance. That costs the average American $7,500 per person per year. <coughs> you all don't know that because you probably get it through your parents and it's like it just doesn't even exist. But the average person spends $7,500. Well, insurance, you, you have health insurance because you don't need that. You get sick because you don't eat right. Well, the insurance actually doesn't cover everything. You've got co-pays and deductibles. So that's another $2,500 that you've got to spend to make up for. Well, then, well, you still don't feel right. So you go out and you get medications and you get supplements. The average American spends about $2,500 on supplements. It's a lot of money. Then we have what's called the obesity tax. This was a study done um, by the Kaiser Foundation, and they determined that it's costing the average American $7,500 to have over a third of the people be morbidly overweight. And then my favorite is the organic food tax. 
the average American spends $60 per person per year, $60 per person per year on organic food. The U.S. food system is $1.6 trillion. It's a big part of our, of our GMP. It's almost 15%. Uh, 39 billion dollars is spent on organic food. Again, that's a rounding error on the food industry. And people complain about it costing too much. What's holding you back are these images we have. Uh, what me worry. My favorite is Doc from Back to the Future. Have you ever seen that series of films? They're great. What happens in the second movie? Doc comes back with a time machine pulls into the driveway and just starts taking stuff out of the garbage can. And what does he say? We found out it can run on anything. And that's the way we treat our bodies. I can eat anything. It's, it'll work just fine. Trust me, this plays in the back of our head. It, it, it convinces us that it's okay. The most amazing thing, they did a study of, of heart attack victims. This was back in 2005. Studied several thousand heart attack victims. They've, they've got to change their life or they're going to die. It's, it's pretty clear. When they have bypass surgery, they've got a problem. Out of 100 people who are studied, how many of them a year after their surgery actually changed their lifestyle? Out of 100, how many would have changed? Five. Less than 10. Again, it's easier to change your religion than to change your diet. And the, the thing is, What's missing, what they, this has actually become a classic case study for business. It's a great article in Fast Company. It's, a, it's an amazing study about how do you get people to change. You've got to give them some hope. You've got to give them a sense of perspective. And that's what this whole program is about this weekend, which is what's so exciting. So very quickly, my experience with Pete's. How many of you are from the Evanston area? Anybody? OK. Have you ever had coffee at Pete's? Mm -hmm. Did you know up until December you were drinking RBST tea and milk? And I brought it to their attention. I said, yeah, I don't, I don't get this. What's going on? And they claimed they couldn't get it. They couldn't get clean milk in Illinois. Mm -hmm. That's what I was told. So I called the corporate office. I said, what, 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 what do you mean? They have 192 stores in the country. 190 of them have no RBST, but the two in Chicago do. So I called, up, uh, called them back and I got the, 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 the purchasing executive. I said, you've got five days. Here's the dairy that Starbucks used. It's the exact same as dairy. Starbucks doesn't get RBST. And the guy said, what do you mean five days? I said, because that's when I'm going to wear a cow outfit saying, got pus? And I'm going to stand outside your, your stores. He said, you would never do that. I said, do you want to try me? And in three days, I got an email from him <coughs> thanking us for pointing out that they could, in fact, get, he said, and I spoke to him, he says, actually, Mr. Robbins, we were embarrassed that you had researched it and we didn't know. I said, well, shame on you. So this has been going on for years, and you didn't even know it. And he said, what's a little, what's a little bovine growth hormone? Again, Google it, see what the, what the side effects are. So here's a picture of David Kessler. You probably have never heard of him. I think I forgot his book. His book is amazing. It's called The End of Overeating. It's an amazing book. The End of Overeating by David Kessler. He was the commissioner of the FDA when GMO food got authorized and okay. And you read two thirds of the book, and it's this amazing expose of the restaurant industry and how they're just toying with us and the over chemicalized food that we eat in, um, just name a restaurant, um, Maggiano's or, or, or obviously the fast food chains, but... Um, Maggiano's though? Of course. Just read the book. You're like, this is not possible. But then the last third of the book is about basically what he's telling us, just say no. And it's, it's not a really satisfying solution to the problem. I, I mean, I, I really threw the book aside and discussed when I realized that was his solution to the food problem. And then I realized after about six months of more reading, it's the only thing we can do is 
It's our local <coughs> action is we just say, no, I'm not going to tolerate this contaminated food anymore. I'm going to demand better food from my local grocer, from my restaurants. So it's, it's, it, it's a local act that we need to engage in. And people say, well, I'm not sure if I know if, if, there's, if there's GMO in it or not. Well, these are the five foods. Read the label. And if it says it's got soybean, corn, canola, cottonseed oil, or sugar beets, trust me, it's contaminated. And just put it back on the shelf. Mm. And move to a food that's safe. Mm. These are the five food groups that you want to stay away from. Is alfalfa going to be on that too? Or? You're not going to know about alfalfa. Alfalfa is going to be in the feed that animals are eating. And they're not going to tell you about that. And what I realized, when I, I was feeling pretty pumped up in December when I won the, won the battle with Pete Steary mm -hmm. and Kemp Steary. I got, man, well, that's great. And then I went, oh my gosh. That was just, that was a diversionary tactic. They've been feeding these cows GMO, corn, and soy for the last 18 years. And we didn't know about it. Mm -hmm. It's everywhere. That's what's got to stop. We've got to put an end to this. And so you've got to vote. You've got to vote with your wallet, and you vote with your feet. And you ask the restaurant, where did this produce come from? What oils are you actually using? They'll say, well, they're vegetable oils. I say, OK, this is a sport for Liz and me. We go to the restaurants and others, and we say, so where did the, what kind of oils? Well, they want us to just leave at that point. You don't want us to know that they're using cottonseed oil or corn oil. That's what most of this food is, is used in these restaurants. So let me just close with this one last thing, just to bring it home about the real food challenge right here in Evanston. You think, okay, Evanston's a pretty hip community, got a really impressive set of uh, residents. Mm -hmm. So that Whole Foods would be a pretty safe place to go, right? I used to think so. We used to get three or four meals there a week. So I went to speak with Izzy Sanchez, is the head chef at the Whole Foods here in Chicago and, and uh, church. I said, Izzy, what percent of the food in your food bar, your hot and cold food bar, is organic? And Izzy does one of these. I, why did you ask me that question? I said, no, I'm serious. What, what percent? And he looks at the food and he says, less than 5%. I'm like, what? What's organic in the food? Olive oil. The olive oil is organic at Whole Foods. It looks, wow, it looks really impressive. So then I'm like, okay. I started asking people, clients and people that I know, I said, if I want to get an organic meal, where am I going to go in Evanston? Everyone to a person said, you've got to go to Blind Faith Cafe. Mm -hmm. you got to go to Blind Faith. So I went down to Blind Faith. I went and talked to the manager. I said, what's organic on your menu? She did an easy. She goes, what? She said, let me go check with the chef. She was gone for five minutes. And then she came back and she said, well, I can assure you that the carrots are organic. All right. Wow. Mm. That's, that's regarded as the number one safe restaurant in Evanston. And then around the corner, I said, well, is there any place I can get an organic meal? And they said, well, there's a, there's a little new place. It's called Organics. It's a play on organic. His name is Nick. So it's Organics. I go in, I ask the manager, I said, what's organic? There's this huge food bar. I said, what's organic in your, in your restaurant? Again, the manager pulls an Izzy. She said, well, the teas are organic. You need to ask where the food is coming from. And when you find out it's not organic, say, sorry, I'll go someplace else. That's what's going to have the biggest impact, is when you <coughs> let them know that you are disgusted with the food that you're eating. And let them know that they shouldn't be, they shouldn't be presenting themselves as a safe haven like Whole Foods does, or Blind Faith does, or now Organics does, and deceive the public. The deception has got to stop. And it, and it rests in our hands. So that's that's basically my message. I appreciate that you all took the time. If you have questions, by all means, yes. Chiropractic 1st.com. That's my cell phone. And I'll take calls any hour of the night. And I appreciate your, your time. Yes. 
Uh, recently at my university we had some scientists come by to give a presentation and, and they were working on um, genetically engineering some <coughs> cassava plants okay. cassava, um, to make it uh, resistant to pests and diseases and then they take that cassava to Africa where you know it's a part of the um, cultural cuisine there, very important to them and they're having trouble growing it because of these new diseases and stuff. So how do you feel about projects of that kind? Uh, how many <coughs> Farmers in India commit suicide from 1997 to 2007. How many farmers committed suicide in the country of India during that 10 year period? A lot, I did hear that. 187,000. And the reason why they committed suicide is because they were told that this GMO cotton is going to enable you to make more money at less expense. And what they found is it's an absolute disaster. The sheep that feed off of the plants are dying. Their, their whole economy is on, on tilt right now. And 17,000 or 18,000 people a year decide, I'm just not going to deal with it anymore. So I, I would be very cautious about what the promises are. And I would do a lot of research about what are the environmental impacts and what are the second and third impacts to the farmer from investing in that process. It is, the most important thing is it's not all it's hyped up to be. It's a lot more complicated than Monsanto and the company wants you to believe. It sounds great. It sounds like you're going to solve world hunger and all sorts of, just Google golden rice. The disaster called golden rice. Any other questions? Thank you all for coming.